Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Workplace Trends India Leadership Series. Today we have with us uh, Professor Sunil Gupta of Harvard Business School in conversation with Bezul Somaya, partner at Lightspeed India and an HBS alumni himself. Moderated by Bezul, Professor Gupta will expand on the pandemic as an opportunity for reinventing businesses, business and digital transformation with new rules of strategy emerging. As a business expert, he has advised several Fortune 500 companies and appeared on many national and international television programs such as CNN and BBC. It was uh, from Professor Gupta that I learned the value of community and being here today as a result of those learnings. I deep honor to have, have them both present on Workplace Trends India today. I would request them to take the charge of the session entirely as they wish to. Thank you, Vizu. Thank you. Welcome on the Workplace Trends India today. And thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor, for coming on the Workplace Trends India. Thank you, Tushar. Thanks, Tushar. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in conversation um, with, uh, with Sunil for the, the second time. Um, and I'm personally really excited to hear how um, his thoughts have evolved since I guess we, we did something similar um, maybe a year or a, a year and a half ago in, in Delhi. Um, so, you know, I'd love to just tee this up, um, Sunil, with this idea that you, you've been a, a very big proponent of, of digital strategy and advising companies on how to embrace um, the digital world for a while. Um, as we sit here today, um, I'd love to just start off by thinking about how has your viewpoint changed? Is it business as usual in the digital world or, or is there something changing even for companies that may already have been going down this path? Um, and also for companies that perhaps still haven't taken the plunge. What's changing? What are you observing? So, Bajal, first of all, it's great to see you and, and thank you for, for being here. i uh, love to have this conversation and with all the viewers as well. Uh, uh, and again, I'll encourage everybody to uh, send in questions to Bajal as we go through. And I'm sure we'll weave in your questions as we, as we continue our conversation. Uh, so, uh, to your question, Bajal, yeah, I've been studying digital transformation for the last 12 years or so. Uh, i written a book about a year and a half ago. Uh, and studied small companies and big companies. And especially for large companies, I think the two biggest impediments that I saw for transformation is one is they find consumers are resistant to change. We are all creatures of habits. Uh, so take example for education that I'm closely familiar with. Students want to be in class, they don't want online learning, right? Because somehow it's not the same in their mind. The second thing is the companies themselves are hesitant to change their business because they have fundamental assumptions of how business works. So again, if you take the education as an example, if our dean asked Harvard Business School professors to go teach online, we will all say very quickly, no, 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 it's a bad idea, it's not the same. So what has happened as a result of this particular crisis is both of these things have suddenly changed. Consumer behavior suddenly shifted and also the internal companies have to question the assumptions of how they were doing business. So this is one of the largest trial in the history as we know it. That uh, telemedicine is another example. For the longest time I've worked with Cleveland Clinic, the doctors at Cleveland Clinic, some of the top doctors in the world are hesitant to do telemedicine because it's not the same in their mind. And patients are hesitant to do telemedicine because again, in their mind, it's not the same but the environment has forced all of us to do that. So I think those two fundamental things, consumers are more willing to try and companies are more willing to test different kinds of business models, which is accelerating the digital transformation. Yeah, and often, you know, I think consumer behavior change is, it's really hard to, to, to drive that change or can be very expensive. Um, so I guess that, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. Are you seeing are you seeing that consumer change um, across industries? Is it consistent? Is it limited to, you know, perhaps businesses where there is a higher likelihood of digital delivery? Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of the, the, the um, participants today, I mean, some of them may come from businesses where you can um, provide the service digitally. You know, you gave a couple of examples, education and healthcare. Others may run businesses that are more traditional. 
uh, maybe manufacturing businesses or other services businesses where um, you know the delivery cannot be necessarily uh, digital. Um, what, what are you seeing? I mean, depending on the industry. So certainly, I think you're right that businesses which are more friendly to the digital delivery uh, are more accelerating in that direction, right? Um, but I think even the other more B2B businesses where people used to come in the factories and do work, they are beginning to realize that, of course, employees can't come to work. So you have to start doing remote work and only a limited number of people can, can be in those situations. So how do you collaborate across the workforce? Uh, lots of work used to be done by paper and pencil, uh, which you can pass on to uh, other workers and colleagues, which can't be done. So yes, I think, again, they started at a much lower level than perhaps many other industries. Uh, so it depends on what the delta you're looking for. The delta might be actually bigger on those B2B and manufacturing industries because they were far behind the curve. Hmm. And so and so, how has the conversation changed in, in boardrooms um, or um, companies that you're advising relative to, again, six months ago? What is, what is if you can just give it, make it a little bit more, you know, yeah. tangible? Yeah. So I think what I have seen in the boardroom, and I'm on the board of a company, also a large company, is that the companies have gone through three phases. The first phase was survival, because suddenly your business tanked. If you're an airline, 90% of our traffic went down or more. Uh, if you're a restaurant business, that sort of went away quite a bit. Uh, so survival mode simply meant that you're preserving cash. So it was a cash crunch for most companies. It was cutting uh, the edges that you perhaps are non that relevant to the core of the business. So it's like going back to the core. That was the first phase. First few months, everybody went through. Lots of employees were furloughed. The second phase that I've seen is uh, kind of a slow recovery. Now we need to do business again, but perhaps the business will not be the same. So if you're a restaurant, you do more takeout, you have more ghost kitchens, for example, rather than your own fixed cost. Uh, and the third phase that I'm seeing happening is people saying, this is the time to reimagine your business. Crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And some of the companies have realized that things that they have been trying to do for two or three years, they could do it in three months. Suddenly the agility has come up so quickly. Hmm. And they say, how did we actually create this organization that is so agile suddenly? I thought we could never do that. And they also find that some of the leaders that are emerging in the companies are very different than the leaders historically that they had before. So they are actually identifying new talent, people who are more savvy, who are more quick to adapt, who are, who are more agile in their own nature, and typically the younger people. So I think the identification of talent and also identification of the processes and the business models that are emerging uh, is great. I mean, I'll give you an example, Pepsi, for example, historically has gone through distributors. Because of this pandemic, they decided to go direct to consumer business also. Now, this was kind of a trial, just a few items they sell direct to consumer, probably not very economical, but they found out suddenly that this is actually a good way to get close to the consumer at consumer data. Now, Pepsi spent so much money on market research through surveys and stuff. This is real data. Consumers are actually telling you what they like about your product, what they don't. So yeah. think about this is a different way of doing market research, different way of understanding consumer taste that Pepsi probably would not have done before. Yeah, for this pandemic. You know, I really like your this point that you made about about talent and how you know the kinds of people that may thrive even within an organization or that may be the right people within an organization may be different going yeah. forward than might have been in the past. And maybe we'll double click on that. But before we do that, that's an example of something that a business leader might want to be asking themselves today, right? So when I look at my leadership, you know, are the folks I have there the right people for this new environment? And, and those can be tough questions um, to, to answer. What are maybe two or three other questions that you think leaders should be asking themselves in this environment that they may not have asked themselves previously? So I think the, the couple of other questions is the fundamental assumption of the business model itself. Okay. Uh, that do you have to do business this way? So I'll give you an example. I'm on the board of a company called US Foods, mm. which is a large distributor of food to restaurants. Now, restaurants certainly are in big trouble uh, because uh, 
nobody's going to the restaurants nobody eating out as a result distributors of food like us foods are also feeling the pain so when this pandemic hit our company started selling to retailers like whole foods which is a huge business we never looked at that business mm. so suddenly you sort of say hey that's an interesting business more cash and carry is an interesting business because people are willing to go to the grocery store but not willing to go to the restaurant so it just shifts the paradigm if you will and suddenly makes the company think are we missing an opportunity are we putting too many eggs in one basket uh, and should our business model change should we have a subscription service should we have a different so i think this it's almost like you have been shaken up mm-hmm. and that allows you to question the fundamental assumptions it, this is a, a shock to the to the system in a way yeah it's it's almost like it, it almost is don't waste this opportunity to get in a room perhaps with people that you trust and and question everything yes. um about who you serve how you serve them um whether those are the right folks whether those products are still going to be needed um and just thinking about the derivative effects of what may you know what may be coming it's like just go back go just allow yourself to go back to the drawing board what it may yield one doesn't quite know yeah and again as a as a vc you're probably used to this you see this from the companies all the time and that's why startups disrupt companies it's just that large companies never have the appetite to do that exercise yeah and, and you know job. yeah and and i love your point about agility because that you know that is so important in these kinds of environments and what usually younger companies have that larger companies don't how do you how do you build agility into um into larger organizations that you know haven't may may not historically have been as agile any 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 pointers for again how you how you flip that culture so i think i mean this crisis has given them an opportunity to just do it in a hurry sometimes when you think too much mm. and design processes bureaucracy settles in and again take an example closer to what i have seen at harvard business school in education imagine if harvard business school decided we are going to go online next year we would have done a massive study how education will change what will happen now this pandemic hit in march suddenly within 2 weeks all our faculty were online and we learned by doing mistakes which is exactly the startup business that you are more familiar with you just learn by doing and this massive process of planning and doing all the stuff it just doesn't quite work and i think this experience has given an opportunity for all of us to learn iterate do something and we are all hesitant to make mistakes mm-hmm. and i think this gave them an experience that even consumers are willing to give you a pass if i'm going to do online education i know my students are give me a little bit of benefit of doubt saying it's okay if i make mistakes and that's something that i think that cultural change and mind shift is perhaps more important that what large you, companies need to learn what do you think that that then means i mean if this cultural change and a mindset shift that that starts at the very top yep so again i'm just trying to think about that if i'm if i'm running a business right how do i how do i take full advantage of this you know advantage of this crisis what are some of the things i may i may want to do is it figuring out two or three people that are you know going to be the most creative people in the organization and get into a bit of a war room with them is it seeking out people you know that that could be um external to my organization but a bit more plugged into the digital world um is it bringing in a consultant uh what 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 is the the way that they can sort of move from here if they sort of realized okay there's a shock this is an opportunity now now what so i'm not an i don't believe in outside consultants or people uh on the fringes of the company just just a few people who are digital savvy and tell them in a war room and do something because if you do that the core of the organization rejects that because you haven't changed the mindset of mm. the 90% of the people who are li- really the core of the people i think what i have seen is the leaders basically get the core people and say what can we learn from what has happened in the last 4 months 
Why yeah. did we actually able to do certain things that we haven't been able to do for three years? And if you have smart people, and most companies do have smart people, they all realize certain things happened. And just studying and learning from that is a great way because this is a forced way for them to question their own assumptions and question their own way of doing stuff. Uh, now, some people will never change, which is fine, but you need to get the core of your leadership team with you. Yeah. Um, you know, as I'm hearing you, some of the things that I want to get your reaction to this, it comes down to as a leader, my mindset shifting, right? And then perhaps pulling together a small group of people and coming back to your earlier point about you may want to think about talent differently is perhaps, you know, maybe we've historically, in a sense, listened to those that have been most loyal or know most about the industry or the business. It sounds like here, I mean, some of the things to perhaps over index on are who are who are the folks in my organization that think most freely? Yes. Right. That are not constrained by, but this is the way it's always been. In fact, it's almost those people that you're probably going to want to just say, hang on a moment, you know, get some fresh thinking. It's probably going to be people that are learning oriented, yes. that, that may have sort of the quickest learning trajectory and curiosity um, about what's going on. Um, are there any other attributes? I'm just picking up from what I was hearing from you. Yeah. No, I think if, if you were to build your team, I think that's exactly what you should do. You need to have uh, the core group of leaders because you can't sideline the people who have been the, at the core of the company for the last 10 years. But perhaps form a team within those core, people who are a little bit more able to shift and learn, as you said. Certainly bring in some of the young leaders because they, they will be the catalyst for change. Yeah. Uh, so it's almost like a mixed team, if you will. Yeah. And give them a specific project. And the first thing would be to simply learn. How did we do it? I mean, people all sort of realize their own potential that if you run a marathon, suddenly you find the strength that you never believe you had. Yeah. And this is like a, suddenly you're running a marathon because the tiger is right behind you. So suddenly you find a strength that you, that you thought you never had. And that realization itself is huge. It's also a bit of a, a great leveler, isn't it? Because it's sort of like, imagine that you are playing a sport and the rules have been a certain way. And, and given those rules, there is a certain set of folks that play the sport better than others. Right. Um, they know the rules, they've, they've refined their capabilities over the years based on those rules. Well, now the rules get changed. Yes. Um, and, and, and those folks that, had, that played the best game according to those rules, with these new rules, aren't necessarily the folks who are going to succeed it, it, with these new rules. Yeah. So to some extent, it's who's going to figure this out quickest, which is, it's, I don't know, I find that empowering in a way. Oh, it certainly is. And I think it's a, it's, it's a, a great opportunity. I mean, as, as somebody said, the crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And this is, companies always look to startups and, and the VCs like you as to how do you actually do this disruption? This is... And you do it day in and day out. It's basically the companies that you invest in are the companies who challenge the fundamental assumptions of business models. And now this is a time for the large companies to do the same thing. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd love to, you know, move on a little bit now and, and talk about there's There's often, and there's a few, there's a few um, questions that have come on this as well. Um, but this idea of, you know, what's the sustainability of these changes that we're seeing in consumer behavior and, um, you know, that then drive companies to change? Um, will it snap back? Uh, because that's something, again, folks can be tempted to think about. You know, I've heard a viewpoint that says when people start feeling safe again, they'll go back and do the things that they did when they felt safe, right? Yeah. Um, so, so kind of your thoughts based on what you're seeing on how, how sustainable these changes are likely to be um, and, and therefore how leaders should think about, you know, building these new capabilities, making changes in their teams, making new investments. So I think I, there is some research that shows consumer habit changes if they are doing the same thing for two, three months. Uh, so there is a sustained, I mean, you have to do certain things for a repeated period of time for it to become a habit. If I did do online teaching once, that's yeah. not going to change my behavior. But if I do it for the whole semester, a whole year, 
I will become more comfortable. I will start understanding the opportunities that the online teaching, for example, in, 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 encourages me to do. I'll give you an example of my parents who live in Delhi. They're 80 plus years old. They never do online shopping before. Hmm. Now they are doing the online shopping and they're finding, hey, it's actually pretty convenient. I don't have to go to the market and lug things. Uh, they wanted to touch and feel the potatoes and the, and the mangoes, but now they don't have to. And they say, this is actually perfectly fine. Now, will they go back? Perhaps they won't do 100% online down the road, but now they are finding there are value for the online grocery shopping that they would have never discovered without this. So I think some habits will change, but I also believe companies need to push that. So it's almost like sometimes consumers, you follow the consumers, sometimes you make the market, you push the market uh, in a certain direction, right? And I mean, India is a great example where a lot of the uh, shopping happens now on mobile phones. Yeah. If you told me 10 years ago that people will buy apparel and fashion items on mobile phones, I said, there's no way because we are used to going to a shop and checking the dress or checking the cloth and making sure everything is fine. But that habit has completely changed and certainly changed for the younger generation. And India has a very large young population, which is perhaps much more willing to change than the developed countries population. Yeah, you know, the other thing that I've, I've found is, um, is, which is really energizing, is the pace at which innovation takes place to support exactly the change that you're, you're talking about. So, you know, what, what I'm seeing, for example, is, is because now there is forced trial of a new way, and whether that new way is a consumer buying or that new way is a small business doing certain things or a large business doing certain things. Now, now they're doing it differently. You know, it's amazing how fast products and companies are cropping up to now support those new ways. Yes. And as those companies come up to support those new ways, doing it that new way gets easier and better, thereby almost kind of driving that behavior change. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll give an example. During this time, if I needed some home improvement, let's say my sink got clogged, I'm hesitant to get a plumber in my, my home. So a couple of Harvard students decided a tele-maintenance business, just like a telemedicine. So they basically say, yeah, take your iPhone or take your phone and uh, show it uh, where the problem is. And we have expert plumbers or expect electricians or whosoever isn't the right person look at that and tell you what can be done that you can do yourself and fix it. It's a free service. This is a great customer acquisition strategy because if you can't fix it down the road, we'll send that plumber to fix your sink. Yeah. Now I would have never done that as a, as a homeowner because I say, nah, I'm not quite sure. I'm not good at fixing things or what have you, but now I'm forced to do that. And suddenly new businesses might evolve as a result of that. So I think that yeah. the, the sustainability is more. And again, remember, if we as businesses go back to doing business as usual, then we are not giving the consumers a chance to change their behavior. Yeah. So it's the good old saying that Steve Jobs used to say that sometimes you are driven by the market, sometimes you drive the market. Yeah, I love that. You know, it's, it's interesting even here, and there was a question here about what about some companies where the nature of the business is, is much more physical um and there's an you know face-to-face -face meeting is involved and, and the example you know the gentleman quoted was real estate and, and i just wanted to sort of use that to illustrate this point and, and and also your point earlier about question everything you know i read an article um a couple of days ago about the the ceo of zillow in the us which is an online real estate marketplace saying they are now seeing end-to-end -end purchases of residential property sight unseen Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's able to happen, you know, because the quality of technology that enables, you know, virtual viewing has changed, you know, and 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 um, and these are companies that are providing that the ecosystem that that sort of stands up around the home buying process has now evolved to support the idea that that, you know, these transactions could happen fully online. So that's sort of that acceleration of what begins to happen to support this new way of doing things. Yeah. And in your example of Zillow, I think there is also some advantages of the online viewing because now I can see 15 houses in a day that I could not do otherwise in a physical world. So I have a better informed, if you will, and the technology is becoming much better. So I have a perfectly fine view of the of the apartment or a house that I'm buying. So I don't think actually, I mean, again, it's a mindset more than anything else. 
that somehow I had to physically uh, sort of uh, pound the street or pound the, the floor of the house just to make sure that the flooring is solid. But otherwise, uh, I think it, things will change. Yeah. And, and I would argue that even in India, actually, it, it's not, you know, um, it, it's not uncommon that people would buy properties from developers off plan. I mean, that that happened, right? You bought it off the basis of a location and a floor plan. Um, you know, so so that that has happened. Um, and and again, if we just think about this, you know, and and um, to your point, question some of these basic assumptions, I think it can lead to surprising, surprising places. Yeah, I'm just curious because Bejul, you are an expert on all the startups in India. What have you been seeing in India, both from startups as well as for the established companies? You know, it, it's been, um, I, I have less exposure to established companies, although from some of our companies that sell to established companies, I'll share what we're seeing. Um, you know, for startups themselves, uh, I would say incredible resilience, agility, um, you know, um, and, and in many cases kind of pivoting uh, required. Um, but fundamentally, everyone understands that this is accelerating the, um, you know, the creation of the digital economy that was already underway. So I would say net, this is an accelerant for all companies that are associated with, with technology. Um, clearly some categories are seeing, you know, very significant lift. Uh, we're investors in an education technology company called Baiju's. That whole area has seen very significant lift again, because it's suited to digital delivery. Um, but we're also seeing, you know, significant lift, for example, in the recruitment you know, and skilling uh, business where that would be another area that historically yeah. we would have said, well, it's face to face. I, I won't hire someone that, you know, that I haven't met. Well, I would be surprised if more than 50% of the participants on this call at this point have not hired someone that they haven't met, yeah. right? Or had a meaningful HR discussion um, that previously would have been in person over the last three months. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I would say that's another, you know, another example. And then on commerce, clearly there's been a very strong um, shift uh, to online from physical. Um, I think in India, a little bit of the force of this change is, is a little slower than what we're seeing in the US and in China. And the main reason is that the logistics disruptions um, yeah. or anything that had to had a physical fulfillment element like e-commerce or groceries, you know, during the lockdown, those were very real. So there were supply disruptions and logistics disruptions, but the demand side pool is, is undeniable. But you made an interesting point about uh, recruitment and training, which I, I, I completely agree. Actually, uh, there's a company based in San Francisco called NAC, uh, which has done a remarkable job. And what they have developed is a gaming, a game, a mobile game, that if you as a potential candidate play on that game, they can identify micro behaviors, how much risk taking behavior you take. Do you learn from your past mistakes when you're playing a game? So uh, if you are on the fork of a road, which, how do you choose which, which direction to go to? This is you're playing a simple game. Yeah. And they have analyzed that to figure out your in, intrinsic traits, which are better than a, an hour interview that you might do with a candidate. Yeah. And they actually, the, uh, lead HR person of a largest insurance company, AXA, has tested that with their traditional recruitment process. And they found that this game actually predicts the candidate's success far better than their traditional recruiting process. Yeah. I love that. Another example of just of just fundamentally challenging, you know, the, yeah. you know, kind of what you always believed, you know, like you spoke about earlier, you know, in, in our business, um, for the longest time, the venture community invested in companies that were within a 30 minute drive of Sand Hill Road in, uh, in Menlo Park. Yeah. And, and the idea was that, um, you, know, you know, almost that you, you needed to, you, you really needed a feel, right? Kind of these companies, you needed to be very closely connected to them. And that, there's certainly truth to that, you know, but today those same firms are committing millions of dollars of capital, you know, to entrepreneurs that they've met digitally. And, right. and it's because you're saying, what are the other ways yeah. that I can accomplish what I used to accomplish, you know, in person. And I think this area of recruiting and skilling, you're right. It's sort of, you know, it forces maybe a different perspective on how are we going to assess talent? 
Yeah. Right. And maybe companies that are in that space, if they can think about how they build those capabilities faster than companies that are still in denial, would stand to benefit. In fact, there is another benefit that many companies are figuring out, like Hindustan Levers and India and Unilever in general and, other, and BCG and others, is that their traditional process that they will send a few people to the business schools to interview and do all that stuff, they were limited in terms of the diversity of candidates they could interview because yeah. Yeah. you can only send so many people to so many places. But with using technology, now they have far more diverse candidates. They have a much diverse pools from all different parts. And that is actually enriching. They're finding people that they will never have discovered. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move us along a little bit here, just being mindful of time. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on the role of, of geography and, um, and uh, country borders to the way we think about our businesses. Um, is there an argument to be made now that your customer could be located somewhere that you never thought they may be in? or that you may be able to reach some of these customers in a way that you never thought you would, or that your employees, you know, kind of the way you think about employee location and, and now your access to talent could be different. So the answer is yes. I think the only thing that is that might hold that back is the political will. Uh, and there's a bit of a nationalism going on, but we can hold that topic separately. Yeah. But Clearly, I think the technology allows the world to be far more connected. I'll give you two examples. One is if you look at Netflix, Netflix has started creating content, global content. So there is the Indian content, there's Spanish TV series, there are German things. And initially they designed that content for the local market. But now people in the US and everywhere else are watching the Spanish contents, which is uh, dubbed in Spanish, which is basically in Spanish. So they're finding the global appeal of even the cultural events, which we thought were very localized. Uh, so definitely, I think the taste and preferences are going across the world. Uh, but there, there is, I think the political challenge is the challenge uh, because the governments are becoming a little bit more parochial and there is a little bit of more nationalistic view that is coming on because of immigration and others, uh, which you see everywhere, right? So that is the only thing that is gonna hold off but technology and preferences are becoming much more ubiquitous all around the world. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, do you, are you seeing companies do anything radical on the, on the employee side again, that can become a source of competitive advantage relative to maybe how business leaders have thought about talent and, and employees in the past? So actually one of my colleagues has done a lot of work with many of the Indian companies like Infosys and others. To, because uh, a lot of the multinational have done outsourcing of the talent work, for example, to India, because India has a large talent pool. Uh, and they say, okay, why don't we set up an R&D facility in India, in Bangalore or wherever else. And their concern always was, will the collaboration be good? In other words, sitting in the headquarters in the US, whereas your R&D center is based in Bangalore, will there be a synergy or not? And what they're finding through this kind of a mechanism is actually that provides some richness and diversity that you would not get otherwise. And, he, and this, this colleague of mine has done extensive research to show that that actually can benefit both the, the remote participants as well as the headquarter participants by that kind of a diverse views. Because we, I mean, the reason why we love diversity in companies is because we get different points of view. Yes. And this is actually an, an, a forced way of creating diversity. Distance creates different points of views. The only question is, can you bridge those diverse points of views to go in the same direction? Yeah. And I think technology and other mechanisms now providing people to collaborate in different ways and yeah. hear different points of view. And that's another example of where, you know, we can see the innovation on, you know, on the future of work technology stack. It's another yes. area where so much is cropping up to enable remote work. Um, you know, that um, it's just going to make it easier and more natural, um, you know, for that, for that to happen. I'll give you one more example. What we are finding in our online education process is what we typically, I mean, you remember the HBS classes, we have 80 minute classes in Zoom. When we do those classes, we can only cover six, 80% of the material. Right. And we, and we sort of scratched our head and says, why is that? And what we are finding is that people who are generally quiet in a classroom 
are much more willing to talk in Zoom. Oh, very interesting. Which is kind of interesting because somehow suddenly it doesn't feel you're not intimidated by 80 other people in the classroom. Yeah. Because in a Zoom, you look like as if I'm talking to you individually. So yeah. I think there's potentially another benefit. We haven't quite explored that in terms of research is that you start hearing the quiet voices in the meetings. Mm. And those quiet voices may actually have some brilliant ideas and that bring in the diversity of point of view. This has triggered something for me, you know, um, these quiet voices says something about what people are willing to do and engage in digitally that they may not otherwise have. Does that create an opportunity for companies to engage their customers in communities or to do things that historically they may not have because their customers and their customers could be businesses, their customers could be individuals, but you know, there's however many people, 300 people on this webinar this evening, right? Like we're all open. We're all open to engaging in a way that we weren't before. Does that create an opportunity if I'm, if I'm a real estate firm or if I'm a manufacturing business or if I'm a retailer, is it business as usual even in terms of how I engage with my customers or is there now the ability to maybe think about doing something new here? No, I think, I mean, people are already engaging with the consumers on a one-to-one -one interaction with the social yeah. media. It's just that even in the social media, we know all the research shows that typically is a large, is a small uh, vocal minority that speaks up much more. And there's a big silent majority. I think whatever we can encourage to hear from the silent majority might actually benefit because, I mean, the people who are silent and quiet are generally quiet because they have very different ideas than what the vocal people are talking about. Mm. And if you want to hear different ideas, those are the people we want to reach out to. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the comments that has come in here is actually uh, around this being the same insight with company town halls. So the way that leaders are communicating with their employees has changed, yes. right? And, and it actually... You know, there are many companies that may not have compete, especially larger companies that may not have communicated with their employees because you're so distributed. And yeah. so you're waiting till you're all in person. Well, now, yeah. you know, kind of you can communicate in a manner that perhaps you didn't before and uh, and people are ready for it. Yeah. 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 So I think, again, I mean, again, uh, let's face it, we'll make mistakes. We'll learn certain things. Clearly, every technology or every different alternative has pluses and minuses. And over time, we'll learn how to leverage the technology and how to minimize its downside effects. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a huge opportunity. Question, you know, here that I think is important. Um, there are some companies that, you know, have really been hit hard uh, by this pandemic. Um, hospitality industry, tourism, um, airlines. What would you say to those companies? I mean, you know, it's it's hard if you're in the hotel business or in the airline business to reimagine the business beyond a point, I would imagine. You know, um, what, what would you say to some of those companies and, and leaders that are on this call that are facing that fundamental challenge to their businesses and to demand? So again, I don't have an easy answer because that's a tough question as to how should re airlines reimagine the business. Uh, but I think it's for the forces them to sort of say, do you need to have such high fixed cost? Were you uh, too optimistic about a certain target customer group? Um, the, some of the restaurants here, for example, Panera Bread, a large restaurant chain, basically realize they get all the inputs for making sandwiches. And they say, hey, why don't we now, people want groceries also, so why don't we also supply grocery items to the same consumers rather than simply sandwiches? So their supply chain, they already get those ingredients. So I think it expands the scope of the business sometimes. It redefines yeah. the customer group. It redefines your cost structure. Uh, so I don't have an easy answer for the hospitality and the airline business as to what yeah. they should do. But I think it's smart people who know that industry well have to sit down and say, well, what are the options? if this thing continues or if the business fundamentally shifts. Yeah. I'm just gonna, um, Sunil, now move across. We've, we've taken some of these questions and, and actually I've been weaving them into some of the, the conversation we've been having. Um, I'm just gonna give me a moment to open these up uh, and sure. see if we can, uh, if we can um, pick some of these things off. Um, 
Let's see here. I'm going to try and pick things off where there's a common thread. So we're addressing questions that multiple people have. Um, so one is, and I don't know if you have a view on this, but you know, one is around um, the impact of geo in India. Um, you know, just given the you know the recent uh, significant financings and announcements uh, by them on you know on um, what it what it means, um, whether it you know it um, it will lead to dominance. Um, perhaps suffocate um, innovation and, and entrepreneurship, um, what it might mean for, you know, companies that like Amazon, Walmart um, on one hand, or, or like the tel telecom operators on the other. So Geo is a very interesting case. In fact, when Ambani's were building Geo and putting billions of dollars on infrastructure, it was very clear at least to me, what the game plan would be. The game plan would not be to make money on the telecom business per se, because they were reducing the price. I believe the data price in India is the lowest in the world uh, because they're literally giving it away. This is the classic razor and blade strategy, which is I'll give you that infrastructure and the basic pipes for free or close to free. But once you get hooked on to my system, then I can, I mean, so imagine Geo says or Amani's have a large entertainment business also. And they say, okay, now you have the bandwidth. What about 100 rupees or 200 rupees per month subscription service? And if you get it from 200 million people in India, that's a huge business. And now I got you hooked on to my entertainment. Now, by the way, you can start shopping groceries from there. So this is almost like a, a building block. And I think this is one of the fundamental things I see happening in all businesses, how the fundamental shift in strategy is happening is there it's an ecosystem that they're building i mean that word is often used and perhaps misused but it's a classic razor and blade you build a business in a certain dimension literally lose money but then you start building on top of that uh, and that creates a huge amount of uh, inertia among consumers yeah if i you know um if you'll allow me to to um uh, push back on you uh, sure. you know, uh, because obviously if that happens, then I'm very nervous and all of our companies are going to be very nervous. So I have a vested interest in believing or at least hoping for a different, uh, a different you know, world. But, you know, I heard that with AOL in the late nineties, um, you know, and, and the same thing for the, for the telcos, um, this idea that the folks that control the pipe, you know, they have, they control the distribution and therefore it is, it is really theirs to now layer all of these things on top of distribution and, um, and, and they'll win. And I, and I heard something similar with the cable operators, um, you know, and content. And at least the, you know, history so far, you know, is suggested that they're good at certain things yep. um, and they're less good at, at you know, um, consumer-based innovation um, the applications layer and, and some of those types of aspects. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So I think that's your, your uh, observations are quite correct. And I would say the reason why the AOLs or the telecoms of the world have failed is because they wanted to do everything themselves, right? So if you remember the telecom companies wanted to build the entertainment content themselves, they're not good at that. Hmm. They should stay with what they're good at. Hmm. So I think this, Secret sauce, in my judgment, is to recognize where your strengths are and partner with the right people mm. and build the alliances, if you will, to do certain things. So that was your reference to ecosystem. Do you take a bit yeah. more of a platform view exactly. or do you take a view of we're going to try and own this and do it all ourselves? Right. So if you build on top, I mean, which is the iOS, for example, you have the application developers, etc. So Apple can't develop all the apps, so it allows those other people. But you build the platform for it to grow and then creates the network effects, if you will. So I think, again, it depends on what they end up doing. And the other thing with the cable companies here, in the, certainly in the US, and I'm sure in India as well, is it's not the fundamental strategy of Razor and Blade is wrong. It's that they are really poor at customer service. Hmm. I mean, in, in the United States, where I live in Boston, uh, we have a cable provider called Comcast. And there are more followers on ComcastSucks.com than on Comcast.com because people hate the service of Comcast. Yeah. So if, if there is a fundamental pain point of the customer that you haven't solved, I don't think technology is going to help you. Mm. Yeah, 
No, that's interesting. Okay, there's another question here um, that I think is an interesting one around the, you know, this, the topic of people. Um, and the question is around in this environment, how does one think about, I'm going to rephrase a little bit, but how does one think about an entrepreneur uh, versus an exec? or I'm going to say a manager, you know, um, and you have a perspective on which kinds of people um, are more suited to managing through this environment. That's an interesting question, but I mean, I always believe a company needs three kinds of people, managers, leaders, and entrepreneurs. So the managers are the ones based, I mean, if you think of a company as to what we are doing right now, what versus what we are capable of doing, right? So where our performance is and where our performance should be. That's the job of a manager basically says, Hey, our goal was to achieve sales of 5% growth or 10% growth. We have achieved only 2%. How do we get that? So is that there's a goal and you improve process. That's what the managers do. Leaders provide vision as to what the company could be, right? So if I'm a MasterCard CEO, I'm in a processing business of the transactions, but I now have the vision that, hey, I can leverage the data to create a separate, completely different business, which is what, by the way, MasterCard has done. Now 20 to 25% of their revenue comes from data management and cybersecurity, which is a very different business than just processing the transactions. And the third type of person in an organization has to be an entrepreneur who literally dreams of what completely different things can be done with the company. So I think a company needs all three. Uh, and if we are talking about reimagining business in a crisis, perhaps you need more of the entrepreneur at this stage. But you also need managers to execute those. Yeah, I love that. I love that framing. I really love that framing. Maybe we could double click and, and, and maybe explore if you think this is a fair question. Six months ago, what might the what might the ratio of entrepreneur, leader, and manager have been? What might that look like now in your mind? How how might that have shifted in favor of entrepreneurs? So I don't I don't know the exact percentage, and yeah. I think it depends on the willingness of the leaders in the companies. But certainly, the pr proportion of entrepreneurs will increase in the companies, and yeah. simply because the leaders are willing to take more risk because they see the world is changing. And they have seen that firsthand how three or four months of this pandemic has shifted the fundamental of the businesses. So they're now willing to in, listen to the, I mean, most companies already have entrepreneurs or people who think very differently. Yeah. It's just that the senior leadership never taps into them yeah. or they become the quiet voices. So maybe being more conscious of this idea of, of promoting entrepreneurs within the organization or seeking them out, giving them a voice. Right. Uh, yeah. A um, couple of questions here, I think important topic um, on as companies embrace digital more fully, uh, there's going to be uh, an impact to employment. Um, thoughts on that and then on, you know, for professionals, um, what would you, to the extent you have a perspective on how their skills might need to evolve, uh, you know, in, in sort of the, the environment going forward? So I'm a strong believer that we need to uh, basically reskill ourselves every so often. I mean, I, I keep telling my university that our model of university education is very antiquated. Uh, that we go to college for four years, then we never go back. Or we go to MBA program for two years and then we never come back. Meanwhile, the world has completely changed. So why do we believe the skills that we got 10, 15 years ago is still the relevant skill today? Hmm. So we need to reskill ourselves. And I think as the technology moves much faster, we perhaps need to reskill ourselves that much faster. And I mean, again, people talk about jobs going, getting lost, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we actually had the chief economist uh, of Google come and give a presentation at HBS some time ago. And he made an interesting uh, statement based on the research that they have done is that the only job lost in the United States in the last 50, 60 years is the job of the elevator operator. Now remember in the elevator, there used to be a guy sitting there who would say, which floor do you want to go? That's the only job lost. Most of the jobs have retransformed. So the way to think about job is job is a series of tasks that there are different tasks performed. 
And some tasks will be automated or go away because of technology, but some other tasks will gain more importance. So we need to figure out which tasks require the human cognitive thinking. And again, there's a lot of research done which says if it's a repetitive work, machines can do much faster than you can. Yeah, yeah. But if it's combining different things, so I think the combining different stuff together is perhaps the where the skill set of the the people will be still very critical. And the more there is a role perhaps for a judgment uh, yes. or decision making in, in uncertain or fluid or dynamic environments, right. uh, perhaps the more there's a, still a role yeah. for, yeah. Yeah, and and, look at the current environment. No AI algorithm could predict what to do today yeah. because the data of this kind of doesn't exist. Well, you know, it's so interesting you say that because one of the, you know, one of the areas that's going through significant upheaval is credit, right? You sort of built all these fantastic credit models and, and based, you know, significantly on bureau scores. Well, those bureau scores have just gone to hell. And exactly. what are you going to do now? Uh, yeah. You know, so, yeah. And again, it creates opportunity for, you know, certain types of entrepreneurs and companies as well. Yeah. So I think it'll always be the managers plus models. Uh, it's just that we need to figure out where models can do better than us. Therefore, we don't spend effort and energy and reskill ourselves onto certain other things. Yeah. Um, there's a question here. I'm really interested to hear your answer to it. Um, the question is, can you speak about one mega trend? Wow. Uh, I think the mega trend, quite honestly, that is worrisome to me is the issue of nationalism. Hmm which is uh, what has happened as a result of all this is countries are closing borders. Uh, immigration has become a big, huge issue for lots of people. Uh, there are trade wars happening in many other places. We have leaders who have more sort of authoritarian uh, perspective, whether it's in the US or Brazil or Philippines or many other places. And that is catching up. I think there is an undercurrent among some people that they are being left behind. And there are two, there's huge income inequality that is being created all over the world. And that will create huge amount of distrust and frustration among a large population. So to me, that's a worrying trend, which cuts, a, goes beyond business, if you will. Mm. And that has a lot of ramifications in terms of business, in terms of uh, the protests in terms of governments, in terms of public policy or what have you. Uh, so I think that's perhaps the biggest trend that I would watch for, hmm. because for the longest time we were talking about globalization. But if you think about it, it's much more the reverse that is happening now in most countries where they're closing borders. And this pandemic has actually intensified their appeal to hmm. closing the borders. So Europe have banned travel from the US. And Australia and New Zealand says we are now safe so that we are not going to allow other people from other parts of the world. So I think this nationalism is perhaps intensified in, because of the, uh, there is a lot more push towards Chinese, there are a lot more racist comments being made about certain people. Uh, I hope that goes away, but I sort of worry that that trend will perhaps persist for a while. What do you think are some of the implications for businesses, um, you know, beyond companies that may get caught up in the crossfire? Um, how, how, how are you seeing business leaders begin, begin to think differently given, given this dynamic? Well, I mean, like earlier we were talking about geographical boundaries. So technology breaks those geographical boundaries. Right. But this nationalism re-erects those boundaries. And even if I can do business across the geographies, the trade wars might stop it. There might be more tariffs. There might be more regulations. Uh, there might be more uh, challenges in employing people from different parts of the world. So I think those government regulations can stop a lot of the progress that technology can make. Yeah, that would really be a shame. It will be a shame. It'll be a shame. But there is a sort of a political movement and there's a sort of a anger among lots of people and frustration and uh, leadership of many countries is uh, not doing a great job in my mind, but that's yeah. a completely different topic that we can spend lots of time on. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's another interesting question that's come in, Sunil, around, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about digital transformation for, you know, for obvious reasons. And the question is, you know, is there anything beyond that 
you know, or, or separate from that, you know, that in this, in this post pandemic environment companies should be thinking about. Now I feel that we've, I think we've addressed some of those, I think on talent, you know, and people, I think that that's a piece we've spoken about. We've spoken about perhaps, you know, reskilling, um, you know, in, in certain ways. Um, but any other, any other thoughts on, we've talked about, you know, perhaps fundamentally questioning these business assumptions, um, but any anything else that we may have missed that you would encourage business leaders to to just be thinking about? But I think I mean if we think about when change happens, the change happens if there is a shift in consumer behavior, and it doesn't have to be because of technology. Maybe the younger generation are uh, more interested in a certain kind of music or certain kind of fashion or whatever it is, right? So there is a change. So if you look at fashion trends long before digital. Every 20, 25 years, fashion trends change dramatically, right? So we had narrow pants and we had bell bottoms and we have narrow pants again. So it's like a shift in mindset and that happens generation wise. So that consumer shifts, consumer demographic shift is another big trend that you need to watch out. Uh, India has a very large young population, which is very different than Japan, for example, which is exactly the opposite. The needs and wants will be very different. The preference and taste function will be very different. And that is regardless of the digital transformation. So the shift in demographics, the shift in consumer taste, that is certainly one major trend that we always watch. Uh, the shift in government regulations or political economy, that's certainly another thing that we that we want to watch for, for as an organization. And then the changes in technology that allow us to do things that we couldn't have done before. So I think there are generally, if you're an organization, you want to watch three or four mega trends that impact your business, some within your control, some not within your control. Yeah. Yeah. I'm now going to pick off the, the last one here um, before we wrap. Um, and there's actually been a thread um, sort of focused on, you know, the impact of all of this on small businesses, um, you know, and, and MSMEs. And, and, you know, the question here is, you know, majority of these companies do business in person. Um, you know, how, how will their behavior change amidst the shift? Um, and, you know, how can they go about ad adopting technology um, and, you know, um, and is it overly expensive and so on? Um, I have a view on this because we've invested in this area. Um, do you want to go first and then I can share mine or? or no, you go first. first. You, see, you have invested in those companies. So. so, you know, I think actually quite unique to India is, is how the economic landscape is, is um, characterized by small businesses. And that this is quite unusual to India. Depending on the numbers, there's 12 to 15 million small retailers. There's actually 50 to 60 million, you know, small businesses. And we've seen a lot of innovation in companies that are serving this community. Um, and so what I would encourage those of you that have questions is today there is, there is very light ERP type software that you can run on your mobile that will cost 500 rupees a month or a thousand rupees a month. Um, there is software today that'll help, you know, small companies track uh, credit outstanding that typically was done in a written ledger and to then be able to collect that credit using um, digital payments. Uh, so that you don't have to wait for customers to come in into your stores. Uh, we have a company called Uran that that um, is essentially um, business uh, commerce uh, for small businesses, and there's been significant uh, growth um, there. So uh, you know my and then and then there are companies that are beginning to enable small businesses to serve their customers digitally, um, including even restaurants where they provide um, catalog management functionality online ordering functionality, and then they partner with a lot of these last mile delivery companies to enable a restaurant to now fulfill um, digitally. So I would really encourage you to, um, to explore. There'll be more than you can imagine that, that you know, can serve uh, small business needs at price points that are actually um, you know, very compelling. So that's my quick thought. No, I think that's a great, observation, a great perspective because if there is a demand, and this is a large market, the SMEs is a large market, I think businesses will develop like the ones you are investing in, which will serve these small businesses because it's a huge innovation engine and a large market itself. The other thing I would say is actually the small businesses may also have to rethink as to what business they are in. So take the Kirana store in India. There are millions of them. 
and you sort of say, what is the impact on the Kirana stores with the Amazons of the world, right? Now, what Amazon doesn't have, what the Kirana stores have is the last mile. Hmm. So Amazon is already working with many of the Kirana stores saying, hey, I don't want to deliver to the local houses because I don't have access to the last mile. And actually it's very, very expensive for me. The Kirana stores historically has, I mean, if you, I I grew up in India, so I know how Kirana stores operate. You have a small shop and there's a Chotu in the back who's talking stuff. And so Kirana store guy is, who is typically a family guy, family owned business. He's sort of projecting what items to stock. So he invests capital, stocks the item and sells those items. Now, Amazon comes to you and says, you don't need to stock anything. We will generate demand for you from the local houses and base and you can help them because they may not be savvy with the online shopping. So you have an iPad or a computer and you tell them how to shop and we will deliver a truck to your store and you deliver to the houses that changes the business model of the Kirana store. It's a symbiosis or a synergy between Amazon and Kirana store rather than substitution. So I think that they can encourage that change of behavior. And, and I think this has been true, you know, um, in the West with a company called Shopify. Yeah. You know, absolutely unbelievable the scale of company they've built, enabling small businesses. Yeah. Um, and so I think this trend is very real and, and actually very empowering for small businesses. Yeah. And I think the two fundamental things that are change in favor of small businesses is it's a lot easier to market using digital marketing tools. I don't have to create a TV ad. Uh, and the secondly, distribution has become that much easier. If I'm a startup, that's why Shopify is so successful. If I'm a startup, I can do e-commerce directly. I don't have to go to Walmart because Walmart is not going to stock my product. That's right. Or, or pay some aggregator 15 or 20%. Right. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to pause here and hand it back to, uh, to Tushar. Um, Sunil, it was an absolute uh, pleasure and delight to. Uh, share this uh, conversation with you uh, again. Um, and thanks always for uh, educating us, um, you know, and, and enabling us to keep learning. Really appreciate it. No, it was a pleasure. Bejul, always great to speak to you. Good to see you, I guess. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bejul, and thank you, Professor. Uh, Bejul, I'm getting one very interesting question for you. And uh, audience is asking how to make billion dollars. Ask Bejul. <laughs> so, do you have any recipe for that? Um, invest behind the best people. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Bezul. Thank you so much, Bezul, for being such an insightful and wonderful moderator. I have attended many sessions, like uh, one session when you were guest lecturer in uh, Harvard and professor was there and I have seen the chemistry that day also and in the Park Hotel with the Harvard uh, you know, event many times. It, it's always a uh, great learning from both of both of you. And thank you, Professor Gupta, for taking out the time for coming on board and sharing uh, your precious knowledge and views with us. We are so grateful and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you to our audience at home and stay tuned to our next session with Ramesh Nair, uh, MD of JLL uh, India, CEO for uh, JLL India. He will be sharing his uh, journey, personal journey from management any to how he become the CEO for JLL India and uh, looking forward to connecting you more uh, with Workplace Trends India. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Bajal. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.